But my topic is, it is false that arriving at truth has nothing to do with reasoning correctly. Well, that's true. So I can sit down and we can all maybe go eat some donuts or something. But I'm sure that more needs to be said about that because we have to think about what is involved in reasoning correctly and its relationship to the truth. Now, when I was a kid, sometimes I would zone out, as kids are prone to do, maybe me more than others. And my dad would say to me, ground control to Major Tom. I didn't know what that meant until later I heard the song, and so I'd go listen to the song, and I was fascinated by that song. The song is about an astronaut, and something went wrong, and his capsule went careening off out into space, and, uh, well, he met his demise out there in the other realms. But that thought horrified me and fascinated me at the same time. And I think about those astronauts who had strapped themselves in a tin can and put a bottle rocket under it and fling themselves off into outer space and think about trusting the mathematicians who are doing the work in order to make sure that all, everything is right, all the calculations are correct, so that they could arrive at their target, their destination, where they intended to arrive. And you think about how one little deviation, one little miscalculation, well, uh, after a few minutes, well, you're just a few inches off course and then a few more minutes, and you're a few feet off course, and then you're miles off course. And then you could empty your entire payload and never get back on course. There's a point of no return for those things. And that thought was really fascinating to me. But you know, it is exactly the same thing when it comes to our thinking. Tiny little deviations in our thinking can have extremely grave consequences. It can cost us tremendously. Now I'm going to quote from Aristotle here who wrote probably one of the first textbooks on thinking correctly. And there is a saying that all truth is God's truth. And so when he discovered these things and they were true, he discovered something that was written into the fabric of reality by God Almighty. It flows out of his being. But listen to what Aristotle had to say about this. He said, since the least initial deviation from the truth multiplied later a thousandfold, admit, for instance, the existence of a minimum magnitude, and you will find that the minimum which you have introduced, small as it is, causes the greatest truths of math mathematics to totter. The reason is that a principle is great rather in power than in extent. Hence, that which was small at the start turns out a giant at the end. Now, what he's talking about is a tiny miscalculation can have severe consequences. And you think back over the years, our brethren say, what does it matter? And you see where they are now. And you see how what they're doing in their congregations, the denominations are looking at them, our brethren, and saying, well, that's not the church. The denominations are calling them heretics. But they said, what does it matter? Because those tiny little deviations, when they unhinge themselves from the Bible, they're out there in outer space, not being guided by truth. Now, we're talking about the, the topic that was assigned to me. We're talking about reasoning correctly. Now, I've already alluded to it, but we need to think about what does it mean not just to reason, but we need to think about what does it mean to reason correctly. Well, you can pull any dictionary and, and get a definition, and most of them are pretty good on this point. But to reason correctly is this, correct. Something correct is conforming to an approved or conventional st standard, conforming to or agreeing with fact, logic, or known truth, conforming to a set figure. And then it lists correctly as an adverb, showing how it is that that would apply to the, the effort you're making to reason. You have to do it correctly. Your reasoning has to conform to the standards of reasoning, the proper standards of reasoning. Otherwise, it's just unreasonable. I think that's pretty clear. And of course, if you thought about that, then you just use reason in order to accomplish that thought. But the Bible tells us that there are ways that we ought to think and ways that we ought not to think. You could probably study the Bible and, and present an entire series of lectures on that point alone. But I want you to think about what is written in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, when the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. When he uses the term reasonable there, it is a, a form of logikos, logikos, which 
is the root word from which we get logic. But he goes on to say, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. There is a way that you ought to think, and there is a way that you ought not to think. But in contrast to that, to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, a lot of people have deviations in their thinking, deviations from being reasonable in the way they think. And just like those astronauts who could miss their mark, it's going to cost them tremendously in the end if they continue down that path. One of those deviations that's very popular and rampant all over this world is the idea that you cannot actually know the truth. Now, Lee's going to speak on that later, and I believe that uh, Michael's going to speak on that later also. But just a, a few things about that. If you don't have a mark, you're pretty sure that you're going to miss it. You've got to aim for the target if you're going to actually hit it. People say, well, we might not hit it. Well, not aiming for it is not going to help. You've got to actually believe that you can get there. Now, in looking this up, you've probably heard this quote before. This quote allegedly, allegedly, allegedly comes from Socrates. And he says, to know is to know that you know nothing. That is the meaning of true knowledge. Now that quote, I copied and pasted, it came from a website called brainyquote.com. And I like to verify quotes, that's a, um, an, obsess an obsession that I have is verifying quotes to see whether or not the person actually said them. And what I found out is that Socrates didn't actually say that. I don't care how many girls post that on Instagram, Socrates didn't say it, that doesn't make it true. So I looked up what Socrates actually said and thought about the context, and he was, he was facing his death. He was going to be put to death for something that he believed in, and he refused to give that up. That sounds a lot like a belief in a truth, doesn't it? Kind of does. But in thinking about these things, he said this, he, or he was talking about fearing death being unwise uh, because of the absence of knowledge, and he said that it may be the greatest blessing. In other words, you shouldn't fear death because you don't know what's on the other side of death. He is talking about a particular kind of knowledge in this context. Now, quoting from him, he said, And is not this the most reprehensible form of ignorance, that of thinking one knows what one does not know? Perhaps, gentlemen, in this manner, also I differ from other men in this way, and if I were to say that I am wiser in anything, it would be in this, that not knowing very much about the other world... I do not think that I know, but I do know that it is evil and disgraceful to do wrong and to disobey him who is better than I, whether he be God or man. Now, Socrates didn't believe in God Almighty that you read about in your Bible, but he understood some things. He said, here's something I do know, and people accuse him of saying he didn't know anything. Now, I think he would have something to do about that. He went on to describe it, and he said, while I live and am able to continue, I shall never give up philosophy or stop exhorting you and pointing out the truth. This man believed in truth, and all of his disciples did likewise. But you know what's really important about truth? Jesus Christ, in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can know the truth. I don't care who says you can't know it. They're wrong about that. My Lord and Savior, who is truth, said, You can know the truth. And he told us how to do that and what it will accomplish for us. But there are other errors and premises that are made concerning proper reasoning. For instance, in the Bible, you read about the Pharisees' errors on righteousness. They thought that righteousness would come through adherence to the law alone. But not only that, they had completely gutted the law and focused only on the aspects that they liked. Well, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, shows about how they had gone about seeking to establish their own righteousness, being ignorant of the righteousness of God. Now, that was a deviation of a premise. All of the subsequent conclusions that they held would be incorrect. On the other side of the coin, you had the, uh, the Greek world who thought that matter was inherently evil, and then they decided, well, their bodies were inherently evil. And so when people talked about a resurrection, they thought, well, that's detestable and grotesque. There can't be a resurrection. And you think about the implications about how they accepted Jesus and also about how they lived their own lives. When you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 and 34, the apostle Paul has to remind them, evil com communications corrupt good morals. Well, they would say, well, what I do in my body, that's just my body as long as my spirit is pure. And don't people think like that today? Don't people think like that today? 
This is precisely the reason in chapter 6 and verse 14, he had to admonish them of, of, uh, about visiting the prostitutes. What they did in their body was one thing. The body is not for fornication. They had to live unto God, understanding that they were going to be resurrected, that they had obeyed the gospel, they had died to themselves, and that affected the totality of what they are, that you couldn't separate out their bodies from their spirits in that way. And so they had fallacies, errors in their thinking, and it, it resulted in the decisions they made as they're walking down the street. You see, those deviations have grave consequences. Today's deviations from the truth and premises, we have people running around saying things like, well, God just wants me to be happy. Do you believe that anybody, anybody who maybe doesn't feel like they're totally existentially satisfied in their current uh, arrangements, you believe that they can interpret Matthew chapter 19 correctly with that false premise? You see, that false premise is going to color everything that they think and everything that they do and everything that they read from that point forward. They've got to go back to that starting point and evaluate that premise to say, is this true? Because if it's not true, it will not comport with all of the rest of the things that the Bible tells them. You think about the deviations and premises that you read about in the book of Job. How it is that Job's friends believed that suffering is always and automatically the result of evil in a person's life. And so it was when they were trying to reason to, uh, to be rational in conversations with Job, they could never get back to the truth because they were clinging to that false truth that lie, that suffering is the result of sin in one's life, always and every time. We have all kinds of uh, deviations in this world today. For instance, you think about the deviations and responsibility concerning individualism and collectivism, and I won't get into all of it, but I want you to understand that a lot of this is the result of evolutionary thinking in our world. Now, you just think about some basics. Is a criminal responsible for their criminal behavior, or is society responsible for criminal behavior? You have, to make up, you have to make up your mind and decide what is the truth about that. In one scenario, a criminal pays his debt to society. In another scenario, society pays the debt to the criminal. I want to ask yourself, which society do we live in? You see, these deviations way back there in one little decision that you make to, that you choose to believe something can affect an entire society and how it functions and how your tax dollars are spent too. Just putting that out there because people pay more attention when you're talking about money than when you're talking about philosophy. So just let that be what it may. But you have false premises concerning the way that people approach believing in God and what it is that they do with their Bible study. For instance, uh, the false premises of the Calvinists, they have defined sovereignty in such a way that it will not admit free will. You think that they can ever understand who God is? Once they've accepted that and they're unwilling to let go of it, it is going to have serious consequences in the way that they filter everything else that the Bible says because of that decision they made way before that. But there are deviations in kinds of thinking. Generally, we call this fallacies in how you operate your mind, not just the things that you think, but how you think also. Norman Geisler wrote a book, of all things, called Come Let Us Reason Together. Great title, right? Basically, it's a textbook on logic. And concerning fallacies in that book, he said this. He said, fallacy is a general term referring to anything that can possibly go wrong in a logical argument. It is important to know fallacies because even though they might be psychologically persuasive, they are not logically correct. They cause people to accept conclusions for inadequate reasons. By knowing fallacies, we can specify why an argument is, is faulty. And so even reason itself subjects itself to certain tests so that you can evaluate the truthfulness of the logic being submitted. Do you, you see that? And understanding how fallacies operate can help us identify them when other people are making these fallacies. He goes on to say this. He says there are two kinds of fallacies, formal and informal. He says formal fallacies are errors in the way an argument is put together. They have to do with the relationship of the pros propositions uh, and the construction of the argument. And then he says informal fallacies are errors in clarity or soundness of the reasoning process. A lot of these have to do with ambiguity, 
or just being dishonest with your terms or failure to define your terms or making an, an appeal to a emotional uh, aspects of an argument in a way that overshadows the logical, rational aspects of an argument. And so there you have informal fallacies. Now I want you, I want you to know this. It would be good to get a textbook and study a good list of all the fallacies. That's fine. But you know fallacies. Let me give you two examples of fallacies. There's the fallacies that involve, and there are a lot of them, there's like 31 flavors of this, fallacies that involve causation and correlation. Just because there's a relationship doesn't mean that one caused the other, and you have to look further into the situation in order to decide which is which. If I say, well, you know, every time a rooster crows, the sun rises, therefore roosters crowing cause the sun to rise. Now you're saying, Jeff, you are an idiot. Because you understand logical fallacies. You know this stuff better than you think that you do. Do you know that everybody who has ever had cancer ate carrots? Boy, stay away from carrots. That's dangerous stuff, right? But you understand, hopefully, <laughs> maybe not everybody understands, hopefully you know the difference between causation and correlation. And when somebody is asserting that there is a correlation, you have to ask yourself also, is there really a correlation? Because, you know, people lie about those things and don't know how to evaluate those things also. Another one, uh, a certain kind of fallacy. These are just two examples of fallacies. You have fallacies of false dichotomies. Now, one of the girls reminded me of this the other day, something I like to say. There are two kinds of people. Now, you think you don't know what a false dichotomy is, but I'm going to show you you do. There are two kinds of people. There are those who believe in false dichotomies and penguins. Jeff, that's not an either or. That doesn't make any sense. I know, that's the point. You understand that difference. There are other options available in that scenario. When you look at the Bible, you see that the Bible utilizes a, a recognition of these facts. In John chapter 9, verse 2 and 3, the disciples asked him concerning the blind man, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And you see how Job's fallacies or Job's friends' fallacies sneak into their thinking, right? But Jesus answered, neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. They've got a false dichotomy, don't they? They had presented an argument which was invalid in its form. And so these fallacies are very persistent, and knowing them can help you to recognize them and avoid them. But we live in a world that has an assault on reason. Now, this assault has been growing and growing and growing. It's actually been evolving and becoming more sophisticated. You know, when I say that, that doesn't sound right. I think it's becoming more effective while, yet, while less sophisticated. But anyways, it's changing nonetheless. You go way back and you find about the modernist movement. And there's a lot of, of shades and different strings as to where this ended up. But basically, the modernist movement, uh, D.A. Carson wrote on the modernist movement, and I'll just read his quote because it's very helpful. He said, modernism as early as the 1600s with Descartes as a transitional figure. Descartes and the modernists held that human reason by itself was sufficient to arrive at truth. Nothing supernatural could be considered. So they're going to make appeals to reason. Now this split in two different ways. First, you had the empiricists who said that nothing could be true if it can't be tested with the five senses. We'll come back to that in just a second. The other class of modernists said that truth can be known by reason and reason alone, and Descartes would be one that falls into that category. But they were excluding the possibility of revelation from God. They would not admit that as a premises for any argument. So they had excluded a certain level of truth from evaluating anything. Well, this was modernism. It ended up being a denial of revelation. But concerning verificationism, the idea that something had to be verified empirically in order for it to be true. Now, I want you to think about this. Ethical language has no, this is a proposition. Ethical language has no truth value because it cannot be tested empirically. Can you put that under a microscope? Can you put that proposition, can you put those words under a microscope and test that proposition, the proposition, can you test it empirically? You can't. Their philosophy doesn't meet the test of their own philosophy. It is a complete and total failure, and it is not the standard for evaluating truth. Upon these failures, this, I said evolved, but devolved would be better, and so we have postmodernism in this world. Postmodernism 
You know, 2016, the Oxford Dictionary, they always select a certain term of the year. And in 2016, they said that that, that was the year of post-truth, and that was their term for the year, post-truth. In other words, all truth is relative. You can't really know the truth, and all of the things go along with that. Lee and Michael are going to talk more about that later, I'm sure. Years ago, before all of the modern LBGQTXYZ stuff, I don't know what the acronym is these days, so I just say that, had really hit fifth gear. I was sitting with a friend and watching TV, and something came on about homosexuality, and this girl said, I, I made some comment about somebody in the room made some comment about it, and this girl said, you shouldn't say that about them. It's their choice. And then after a second, she said, besides, they can't help it. They're born that way. <laughs> now, false dichotomies, that's, you know, you have to realize, how do you, how do you evaluate these things? Well, which is it? Are they born that way and they can't help it, or is it their choice? Don't call it an alternative lifestyle. There is no alternative for them if they're born that way, which they're not because God didn't create them that way. And so we live in the post-truth world. Now, truth is still very much here, but our society chooses not to believe in it. They choose not to believe in it. It's still there, but they choose not to believe in it. One of the major philosophies that affects this is the philosophy of deconstructionism. Now, I started looking for a definition of deconstructionism, and that was basically like trying to unscramble an omelet. You can't do that. But I came across some suggestions of what deconstructionism is, and here's what I came up with. Here's a few of them. There have been problems defining deconstruction. Derrida, that's Jacques Derrida, one of, uh, one of the French philosophers that was the leading proponent of this idea, defining deconstruction. Derrida claimed that all his ethes, essays were attempts to define what deconstruction is and that deconstruction is necessarily complicated and difficult to explain since it actively criticizes the very language needed to explain it. Going on, another one, Paul DeMann uh, from Yale, one of the practitioners of deconstructionism, he said this, it's possible within a text to frame a question or undo assertions made in the text by means of elements which are in the text, which frequently would be precisely structures that play off the rhetorical, uh, that play off the rhetorical against the grammatical elements. Basically what he's saying there, and you'll see this in some of the other quotes, is that all language is inherently in conflict and you can't know what anybody's saying. We'll circle back around to that. Richard Ward, he said, the term deconstruction refers to the first instance to, uh, to the way in which the accidental features of a text can be seen as betraying, subverting, or purportedly essential its purportedly essential message. In other words, language in every speech is going to betray or undermine the inherent meaning of that text. Going on, uh, Niall Lucy um, pointed the impossibility of defining the term when she said, uh, while in the sense it is impossibly difficult to define, the impossibility has less to do with the adoption of a position or the assertion of a choice on deconstruction's part than with the impossibility of every, and this is in quotes, is as such. Deconstruction begins, as it were, from a refusal of the authority or determining power of every is or simply from a refusal of authority in general. Now, I know you have to read through those a few times. I read them through those a few times before I really got into what they were saying. But does this sound familiar? When a United States president gets on TV and says it depends on what the definition of is is, these people don't believe in any kind of authority, that there is no authority, that there's no truth invested in meaning. When you say something, you didn't intend to say anything. You just don't realize that. You know the problem with every, one of these, with every one of these definitions and the philosophies that they're trying to define? They write books to tell you that words don't mean anything. Do you understand what they're doing? They're writing books to tell you that words don't mean anything. Now, I think I've told you this before, but sometimes people are fond of saying, uh, you know, you can make the Bible mean anything. And I, I've taken a saying, well, you know, I'll take PayPal or Venmo or direct deposit. And they say, what? You just said you were going to give me $1,000. I said, no, I didn't. I said, oh, I can make your words mean anything. You don't like that? I mean, I can abuse what you said. I can choose to misunderstand you if that's what I choose to do. If I intend to misunderstand you, I am very capable of doing that. But it's not honest. It's not decent. And it doesn't make the world a better place. This is an assault on logic. We also have logic phobia. 
And Brother Thomas Warren, in his book, Logic in the Bible, detailed a lot of logic phobia. And in that book, he specifies one particular area is an absolute refusal to understand implication. That one thing can actually imply something else. And we'll come back and talk to, about that. But if you haven't come across this fear of logic, it basically comes down to several things. I used to, I used to collect comments that illustrated this fear of logic. But this is kind of like looking at the weather channel when it's raining outside. If you haven't encountered this fear of logic, it's because you're either not evangelizing or you're not listening to the way that people respond when you're evangelizing. It's one of those two things. And that's not a false dichotomy. Because it's out there. People have a total fear of logic. Now, you think about uh, getting ahead of myself a little bit on implication. If I were to take a penny and I were to put it into an envelope, and then I were to take that envelope and I were to put it into a box. I haven't explicitly stated that the penny is in the box, but you know it is in the box. Now, you might have logic phobia because, because somebody has used logical forms. They put things into form with the attempt to try to fool you. I understand what it feels like to be snookered. But your mind is thinking about those things. You know what you've done? You've made an appeal to reason, another set of circumstances, another kind of order. We were talking about spatial order when it came to the penny. But now you're talking about volitional order. You've admitted another detail. When you're skeptical of somebody presenting an argument, you are using reason in order to evaluate it. You're not getting away from reason. You're trying to run to reason. But running away from it is certainly not going to help. Or attempting to run away from it is not going to help. This reminds me of what Isaac Asimov said about knowledge. He said, if knowledge can create problems, it is not through ignorance that we can solve them. That just makes sense, doesn't it? You think about the way that people react to trying to, to, trying to boil things down and, and to be logical. Now, let's get right down to define the terms of what you're talking about. They say, well, are you trying to trick me? I'm saying, no, I'm trying not to get tricked here. We understand the value of reasoning correctly. And if you don't, well, then uh, just think about the things that your banker makes you sign. And suddenly you believe in logic. You know, it, it amazes me when you say to somebody after they make a statement, only a false teacher would say something like that. They say, are you calling me a false teacher? Suddenly they believe in implication. And then I make an appeal to the law of identity. If the shoe fits, that's the law of identity. But what is it to be rational? What is it to be rational? <laughs> Aristotle spoke on the law of non-contradiction and talked about it. He said, again, if when the assertion is true, the negation is false, and when the latter is true, the affirmation is false, it will be impossible to assert and deny with truth the same thing at the same time. Now, he's talking about the law of non-contradiction. But he says, but perhaps it will be said that this is the point at issue. In other words, this is what we're talking about. What he's introducing here is, are we going to be reasonable or are we not? That's the first thing. Are we going to be reasonable or are we not? He goes on to talk about this. He says, clearly then, if both kinds of thought, reality also will be both so and not so. In other words, if you're violating this non-contradiction, something can be so and not so at the same time. He said, it is along this path that the consequences are most difficult. For if those who have the clearest vision of such truth as is possible hold such opinions and make these pronouncements about the truth, surely those who are trying to be philosophers may well despair. For the pursuit of truth will be as chasing birds in the air. They didn't have helicopters in his day, you see. If something can be so and not so at the same time, what are we even talking about? Why are we even talking? I can make your words mean anything that you want them, what I want them to. And then once I've done that, you can make my words mean anything. What are we even trying to do? Why even bother thinking about things? Just sit down and, and quench all the thinking. But this is the point. What is it to be rational? To be rational means that you observe reality, that you order your thoughts in conjunction with that reality, conforming to that reality, and you make determinations concerning the order that is in this world. Our God is a God of order. And when we are talking about logic, we are talking about order. I already made an allusion to that when we talked about spatial order of putting the penny in the envelope and putting the envelope in the box. We're talking about ordering thoughts. Norm Geisler said this. 
He said order is the key word. It applies to all kinds of different disciplines in nature. There is order that reason discovers but does not produce. It discovers but does not produce them. And then he observes a few examples like crystals and all of the, the natural world and how it is that you discover that order. The same is true concerning reasoning. And he says... Uh, all these show us the, an order that we can see, but that we did nothing to put there. Just as you can read this book, but you didn't put the words on the pages, did you? Somebody says, well, logic is just a construct. How did you determine that logic is just a construct? Did you recognize that and discover that order in all of reality in order to present that conclusion? How did you decide to put your words in that, in that order? Using proper syntax. Syntax. Construct logic is order. What? You see, people choose to comply with things when they like the conclusions, and then they dismiss them when they do not. To be logical, to be rational, is to recognize the order of things. Now, I'm going to have to skip over a few things, but the usefulness of logic, and I said this already, is that it submits itself to evaluation, but the usefulness of logic means that we have the correct standards for evaluating truth. What is the standard for evaluating truth? It is not the way that you feel about it. If evaluating truth had only to do with the way that you feel about it, then you would have a difficult time explaining what sackcloth and ashes are in the Bible. People heard truths that made them feel bad, and they decided to bring their life in conformity with those truths. And you know why they, were, why they felt bad? is because they logically evaluated those truths and realized their lives were not in conformity with it. We have to recognize those things. Your feelings are not the proper guide for truth. Neither is all of society at large. We have to have the right standards for measuring truth. You can't go out and, and measure the temperature of the air with a ruler. You've got to have the right standards in order to know what it is that you're looking at. If you're flying in a plane and you have, I don't know what they call them, whatever measures the altitude, if that thing is wrong, you're going to hit something. You've got to have the right standards for evaluation. We already talked about Romans chapter 12, 1 through 3, and how it is that we ought to think and how it is that we ought not to think. You have to have the right standards. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, the Proverbs writer said, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Your feelings are not the standard for truth. Truth is the standard for truth. If it complies with truth, it's true. If it is in contradiction to truth, it is false. It is just that simple. And those are categories, categories relating to order. And things either fall into that category or they do not fall into that category. And logic and ration are just as simple as that. Now I want to talk about a few of the laws of logic. And this is not a logic class, but I just want to introduce these and then continue on to the part that I really want to talk about uh, as time permits. There is the law of rationality, and the law of rationality stated, and this comes from Brother Warren's book, uh, Logic in the Bible. The law of rationality says that men should draw only such conclusions as are warranted by the evidence. Or, as Lionel uh, Ruby put it, we ought to justify our conclusions by adequate evidence. To say that evidence is adequate is to say that it is relevant to and or sufficient to warrant the conclusions to which it is directed. You've got to prove things. That's what he's saying. You know, we find this in the Bible in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, when the Apostle Paul said, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. You have an obligation as a rational person to put forth evidence for the things that you believe. And you have an obligation to evaluate things before you believe them, to prove those things. If you do not do that, you are not a rational person. You can sail right through a red light. And you can say, Officer, the light was green. Okay? Is there evidence? Are there witnesses? Can we go to the red light cameras? You've got to evaluate that. You can say, Well, I believed it was. So what? People believe all kinds of things. You're not a rational person if you do not operate this way, trying to evaluate and prove the things which you believe. And if you believe something that's not proven, you are not a rational person. You have that obligation. In John chapter 7 and verse 24, Jesus says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge the righteous judgment. Your judgment has to be along the lines of the correct standard of judgment. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, John wrote, Beloved, believe not every spirit, 
but try the spirits. And my brethren say, believe every spirit unless they expect you to try something. That's what a lot of my brethren believe. But that's not what John wrote, is it? And if you're operating by a different standard, well, then you just don't love the brethren, 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, because this is one of the commandments of God. But here he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whither they of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, the brethren were commended for doing exactly that thing. They were commended for doing that. But how does this rationality relate to faith? Sometimes people say, well, faith is when you just believe something. You just choose to believe it. That's false. Your faith is based on evidence, a certain kind of evidence, but nonetheless, it is based on evidence. One writer, Joseph Evan Sagebeer, said this. He said, the mind has no especial faculty for the discovery of the truths of religion or for the solving of the problems of religion. These problems, like all others, make their appeal to the reason. There is no other tribunal to which they can appeal. If it be said that in matters of religion, the appeal is to faith, it must be remembered that faith is a reason exercising itself upon one class of cases and that its functions are still performed in accordance with all the laws of reason. Now, he wrote that in a book called, appeal, uh, called uh, An Appeal to Scripture. By the way, he was a Philadelphia lawyer, just for what that's worth. But do you understand that when you have faith in something, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, the basis, the evidence for what you believe is the Word of God. If you don't believe that God is a credible witness, then you have a problem. And he stands up to all of the tests of truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Walking by faith is not a blindness. We walk by a different standard of evidence, not empirical evidence, but by the revelation of God that tells us that these things are so. In Hebrews chapter 11, 1 through 3, the Hebrews writer says, Now faith is the substance, the thing that stands under the foundation, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I know that there is a heaven, just like I know that the, the carpet here is blue. By the way, you saw the discussion on the internet about the dress, whether it was blue or whatever other color. You know, you learn certain things by that. Sometimes what you learn is that your perception... Your perception may not be a good standard of truth. You can look at that and you can do a spectral analysis on it and determine the truth of it. You can go and ask the person who created the fabric what color it is. You can make an appeal to find out what the truth is. But sometimes you learn that your five senses can deceive you, which is why you need to verify things. But when God tells you that something is true, it is true. That's the law of identity. I have to skip over a lot of the laws of thought. I just want to encourage you this way. Go and pick up or find a copy of Brother Warren's book, Logic in the Bible. It's a short book. It's a good read. And I was joking the other day talking about this book. When you go out and you talk to your brethren, after reading that book, it almost sounds like Brother Warren was a prophet. Because he describes exactly the state of the church today when he was giving those warnings a long time ago trying to explain people about why they need to reason correctly and why those incremental errors are such a problem. I want to leave you with this last thought. I've got a minute and 15 seconds according to my watch. And my watch is the correct standard, not the other watch. <laughs> Our God is a God of order. We need to accept only the conclusions warranted by the evidence. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, we're told that we need to give a reason for the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. You have to give a reason, a rational defense on why you believe what you believe. I don't have to answer everything that you can come up with about the Bible. In the context, he's talking about suffering, and he's talking about the hope. He's talking about the hope. My hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When somebody wants to quibble with me about all of the things that they think they found in the Bible, which they haven't, books have already been written answering those things, but when they want to, they want to talk to me about those quibbles that they have, I want to ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ existed on the face of this earth? Do you believe that it's a historical fact that he rose from the dead? I want to talk about that. You can't prove anything else. He was a man. He died. He was in that tomb, and he rose from the grave by the power of God. And everything that he said is true, proven by that fact. Everything he said. When he says Moses wrote the books of Moses, Moses wrote the books of Moses. Because a guy who was dead and got up and walked on this earth, he told me that. 
And that can't be accomplished by reason alone. And there are, this is the fact that we have in this world. We can know these things. And you have to use reason to evaluate these things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the brethren were denying this fact. And that was contrary to reason. You read that. Paul reads like an example of a textbook on logic. I'm going to ignore that for just a second and say this. In Matthew chapter 22, the Sadducees denied the resurrection. And the Lord said, have ye not read? And then he made an appeal to Exodus chapter 3. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but the living. People say, well, yeah, implication is true when Jesus Christ tells me that that implication is there. That's not the point. He was chastising them for failing to infer what was implied. If you don't infer what is implied by the Bible, you will lose your soul. Thank you.